so Canon Thrawn's a bit more diplomatic. Yeah, but he had a particular bone to pick with Tarkin. What bone was that? Kind of the rich get richer kind of thing. He didn't think mm. that Tarkin really earned his position and was just playing favorites for the for the Emperor, with the Emperor. <laughs> it's like, Tarkin, you're such a Nepo baby. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. That's great. Literally. <laughs> Hello there. You found the Lost Holocron, an ancient artifact of lore and legend from a galaxy far, far away. Each transmission of the Lost Holocron, you will be joined on an episodic discussion of media from the Star Wars universe. We will be your guides. There's Tim. Hi. I'm Kyle. We have Scott. <laughs> and Stuart. Uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> we will be covering the material up to and including chapter 10 of Dark Force Rising. Scott, what happened so far? What happened so far? You missed the perfect opportunity to press the button again. <laughs> <laughs> to pull it right up to the microphone. Wow, look at that peak. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. By the way, I got a screaming goat for... <laughs> <laughs> It's more fun for me, though. <laughs> I do like how you're like, oh, I got it for, the, for them. It's been up on your desk and you're just pressing it repeatedly. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that goat scream is now part of our file. A fine addition to our collection. <laughs> Look, honey, I swear this PS5 is for you. <laughs> Look, it's a perfect birthday gift. <laughs> It's for the family. Come on, check out Astro's Playroom. (laughs) Story so far. Admiral Akbar, the military head of the New Republic, has been arrested under suspicion of treason. Through the... Uh, Hold on, that one's for 11. Ah, crap. We're doing 10. Here I am, ahead of the game again. (laughs) Jesus. Tom Holland strikes again. Story so far, okay. (laughs) <laughs> All right, cue the scream again. Um, the story so far, Grand Admiral Thrawn has tasked the Nogri with the capture of Leia Okrama Solo and her unborn twins. After many failed attempts, Thrawn travels to the Nogri homeworld of Honagur to impress the importance of their success. Leia and Chewbacca capture a Nogri operative on Kashyyyk. During the interrogation, the operative Kabarak identifies Leia by scent as the Malari Ush, heir to the revered Lord Vader. In exchange for a solo embassy to the Nogri homeworld, Leia allows Kabarak to leave and meet in one month's time over the forest moon of Endor. Leia, C-3PO, and Chewbacca arrive a day early, and when the Falcon passes through the point where the Emperor died aboard the second Death Star, Leia experiences an overwhelming wave of dark side energy. Kabarak arrives as promised. They transfer to Kabarak's ship and take the four-day-long and take the four-day trip to Nogri homeworld, a planet that looks all but dead. They are surprised to see an Imperial Star Destroyer above the capital and divert their course to Kabarak's clan village, which doesn't go unnoticed, and Thrawn directs Imperial scrutiny to the Kimbar village. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tim, what happened in Chapter 10? Oh, man. In this chapter... Kabarak's ship lands at the Kimbar village. Leia, Chewbacca, and C-3PO stay on the ship, while, in accordance with Nogri law, Kabarak announces the arrival of the outsiders to the clan Matrak. Chewbacca disappears into the ship to sabotage the electronics to obfuscate their presence, leaving Leia to anxiously wait until Kabarak's return. Without Chewbacca, they hurry through to an inauspicious meeting with the Matrak. Despite obvious tensions, the Kimbar clan will honor Kabarak's promise of refuge and diplomacy, obscuring their presence deeper in the village. The Imperials arrive to extract an explanation from Kabarak for his month-long absence after the failure of Commando Team 22 on Kashyyyk. The sabotage to Kabarak's ship is undetected, and the ship is taken with the Imperials back to Nistau for repairs. Thrawn suspects there is more to be learned about Kabarak's reclusion, but that is all secondary to the capture of Organa Solo. Yeah, these no great names are cool, but man, it's hard to say a lot of them in succession. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Matrak is really fun though. Yeah. yeah I like that. I like yeah. how it sounds like Matriarch, yeah. 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 
which Tim mentioned last time that hon- Honaga seems to come from the word honor mm-hmm. and Matrak is coming from matriarch. Um, I wonder how much more of these names that from the Noga culture are just some slightly obscured English word that we can kind of come up mm-hmm. with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a good way to approach words in Star Wars. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because, um, you know, it's like it's you wonder if they get some of their words from like Galactic Basic and then they just kind of like change them a little bit to be like their own words. Mm. It's like Tagalog did that with like Spanish words, for instance, like oh, because cool. of, they were under the influence of the Spanish for so long in the Philippines. You know, like some words like Kamustaka, for instance, kind of sounds like Komosta. Oh, um, wow. And then like some other words like they some other words are just straight up Spanish words mm. that they didn't really bother to change. It's like they didn't really have a word for it pre- previously. I don't I don't know if they did or not, but mm-hmm. they may have just adopted something that was more common for them at the time. Mm. What if basic takes from a lot of other cultures like the other way around? That's kind of what I was thinking, too. Yeah. And, mm. and, you know, in the case of Star Wars, because their galaxy is so big that the galactic basic may have just evolved from, you know, different cultures and different planets and everything and just to kind of like evolve into like one thing. Which probably helps make it uh, pretty accessible too. Yeah. And that makes it galactic mm. basic, you know, yeah. in, a, in a way. Yeah. You know. and, and it's influenced from the, basically the entire galaxy. I mean, none of us have read these in other languages. I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. You guys haven't read this in Spanish, have you? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but like, I wonder how that translates for native speakers to be reading these things um, because they are so close to English, Um, whether that experience is quite different when you, when they do do the localization for different places. Cause like, as, as you said, Scott, when importing words from other languages, it has to go through what phonology is legal and illegal in, in that language. Mm. Uh, So that's why you hear a lot of, they call it katakana English or like Japanglish mm. sounds very <laughs> staccato because their language forces them to put um, vowels in between all of their consonants. Do you have an example of that? Like, um, like the word black would be mm. bu da ko because mm. um, that explains a lot. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, my girlfriend and I have been going through Hayao Miyazaki movies recently, and it's mm. my first time listening to them of just the Japanese audio. Mm. And it's fun to hear them say like um, non-Japanese names and hear those vowels they add in that you described. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Capitan. <think> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What would a Miyazaki Star Wars be like? I'm thinking very magical. Oh, yeah. I did continue watching more of... Um, visions yeah. although i still yeah. have the same problem that i have with it that they all seem like they're on their first draft yeah <laughs> yeah some of them definitely do yeah. but a number of them feel very like miyazaki-esque in just the i don't know the way that the wind whips through the cities or the, the character's mm. hairs or or mm-hmm. something <laughs> but like it just feels very very um miyazaki i wonder if um that's more kurosawa because uh, Akira Kurosawa is a major, like, influential um, filmmaker on the style of Star Wars, and he tended to have like massive torrential downpours or like huge gusts of mm. winds in his movies. Mm. Like the elements mm. would just go crazy. Hmm. And so I wonder if they're pulling from that. And then I also wonder if Miyazaki's pulling from that. <laughs> if so, quite possibly. Yeah. Because the two that I'm really thinking of is um, the one where. There's the gathering of the Jedi um, mm-hmm. by some person that wants to push back against the new tyranny and lightsabers have been a lost technology and they're just being reforged by somebody mm-hmm. um, that on the ground with a lightsaber smith, that area, which yeah. is on like a, like a hover bike, the daughter's on a hover bike or something like that feels very Miyazaki to me. Is this the ninth Jedi? The ninth Jedi, quite possibly. Mm-hmm. Um and then there's the one where it starts out with like a couple in in the woods getting married and he's got her on some sort of like backpack type thing and just them trekking through the forest right and there's some like 
force ripple or something communicating with the planet that feels very mm. Miyazaki as well yeah yeah I feel like the way he approaches nature would work really really well with the Star Wars and the force mm. yeah I think so um <clears throat> I like the um the image that we're getting of the Nogri here as well just the evolution that we've seen them go through has, has felt quite natural uh our first impression was I think in the very first chapter of Ed of the Empire with Peleon being creeped out as he's going to <laughs> talk to talk to Thrawn and he's just like in that antechamber but waiting for him, Rook is, and he just can't see him because he's a shadow in the night and and then they touch down on Wayland and Rook just like just demolishes a building with mm -hmm. surgical right. <laughs> precision that we get this I, image of them being highly competent, real predator type mm. aliens, right? And then as we see them through, through the abduction attempts, they get a little more progressively. Um, uh, I don't know. We see, we see a kind of like camaraderie among them that they're all sticking together down to the last man kind of, kind of combatants and then once we get the introduction of Kabarak he seems very honor driven which is when we get the 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 recognition of of Leia as the Malariush mm -hmm. I just I, I it kind of changed that image it softened it a little bit that they're really I don't know I, I, I do think that they, that was the first hint of the, an honor bound con culture that then we get uh, them progressively looking more and more like C-3PO says she's a, that, that they are a pre spacefaring civilization. Mm -hmm. And then from that, at the very end of the, the chapter, there's like this comment that Peleon makes about a bloody history between the, the different clans. And so I feel mm -hmm. like it's a really consistent image that has like, we've got this real, close up of yeah. of the assassins moving out to um you know Thrawn's dismissiveness when he talks about the um the Nogri as well that mm -hmm. it's a really clear progression of like an expanding circle of what we know about them yeah and how that changes our perspective on them knowing they have a bloody history also um makes their current culture very believable mm. cuz they um they have a very strict like hierarchy of power and it seems like they enforce it very strongly um mm. perhaps as a way to keep from further violence not that they're violent creatures more that um like a reaction to things they experienced in their past what, what, what do you mean by that so i mean if they had a lot of fighting i would think eventually that you know someone wins and they're like hey let's stop and but instead of like a peace treater or a ceasefire it's more like um really a uh, strict rule this is your matrix. listen to them this is your clan leader listen to them like mm. don't go against them yeah so essentially to uh quell dissent and potential for the violence from there a strongly enforced rule mm. Mm. yeah but it seems like everyone is into it at the same time <laughs> yeah you Maybe there's a Nogri somewhere that's like, wow, this kind of sucks, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they're, they're not a part of this story. <laughs> mm. I think it, we, we're getting a little bit of, of that because like these honor bound cultures are a little bit, you know, rigid in the, in the things that they're expecting and the, and how things are to be done the correct way. Yeah. But as we're seeing, uh, Kabarak is ambivalent about all this and even the 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 I want to call it the matriarch, but some may track may track. Mm -hmm. She has a really nice line that I like, which is "I I greet you, but I do not welcome you." Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's yeah. good. I'm gonna remember that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just the way that um, that stuff comes about that does seem that there's like a, nobody's particularly happy in this situation we've been forced to stop our our feuds there seems to be some underlying tension with things that you know we haven't forgotten the past 
<laughs> at the very end of the chapter, there's um, uh, Thrawn's like, okay, we need to detail the city. And <laughs> Peleon's like, do you want that to be one of our people or one of their people? And it's like, ah, yes, the painfully political or the Britishly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> but yeah, it just feels like a lot of people are walking on eggshells in this situation and... It seemed like, like I said, with those expanding circles, it's, it seemed like they were quite uh, like ruthless, willing to die mm-hmm. for the empire. But as we look back and say, "Oh no, they're kind of indentured servitude," mm-hmm. things are ready to flip. You can feel it. Lead a rebellion, Leia. We've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> no agree, rebellion. <laughs> are you ready for a rebellion? Just add Leia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instant rebellion. Yeah. Just add Leia. <laughs> So if there is a long and bloody rivalry, why do you think that Rook is so loyal to Thrawn? Because Thrawn Very. doesn't seem to have any mm. qualms about saying something. He says something quite callous, like, oh, we can just keep throwing Nogri at, at the problem until <laughs> it goes away. Wave of no <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> it's not like he's going to say that to Rook's face. <laughs> uh-huh. But Rook but is, like, always there. He overhears true. this stuff. He probably so, heard it, yeah. He, he definitely doesn't try to hide it from Rook. Mm. Sure. Maybe... Maybe Rook thinks a bit differently from the rest of the clan. Yeah. Or the clans. Mm. I feel like he, he kind of finds himself to be more within like Thrawn's realm rather than the Nogri realm. Mm. Maybe he sees himself as part of the Empire, not a yeah, servant to right, it. Right, right. Mm. You think that makes him quite young then? You know what? Or, I could, yeah, I could yeah, see yeah. that. Or do you think he's a veteran that's seen like the old bloody ways and is like, mm, you know what, we get a lot more order and a lot more better things done under this rule. Hmm. God, both of those are good possibilities. I, don't know. I kind of get the impression that he's like, especially from like the rebels, like the way he was portraying rebels. I kind of feel like he's kind of like younger and mm. feels like he has to prove himself to throw. I guess. Yeah. Although having read the canon throne, like the relationship between the empire and the nogri is totally different mm. like completely different thrawn is a lot more um culturally sensitive i guess in the common oh in the in the disney canon and mm. he wants everybody on the same page he wants everybody to be loyal to the empire for good mm. reasons for sustainable reasons mm. um not just this kind of like strong arming a little bit belligerent i feel Thrawn is quite belligerent in the in these old books. What do you mean by belligerent in his case? Um, just he does in the case of being a warlord uh-huh. that he is quite bellicose, quick to fight, um, and just find a violent solution to the problem. Um, gotcha. hmm. So Canon Thrawn's a bit more diplomatic. Yeah, that's hmm. interesting. I think the um, like the key word would be that um sustainability in his yeah. mind because in i think it's the and the third one he is like trying to walk this tightrope between his own people the chiss and the the empire and there's um director krennic's dog hmm. not dog dog but like there's this fawning character that's like director krennic is the is um is a visionary for for the empire and everybody else is just uh <laughs> incompetent and uh here on laurels and and political jockeying and he ends up manipulating him in the end to go off and join the chiss because he wants the chiss to join the empire in the end well i actually don't know thrawn's motivations at that point Hmm. it seems a little unclear at the end of the book what thrawn actually wants i think he wants some like mutually mutual cooperation between the chiss ascendancy and the and the empire Mm. without one necessarily overriding the other like them respecting their own boundaries i guess is what he wants in the end but he ends up sending this this lackey into the chiss because he's like well i know that you don't respect anybody in the imperial hierarchy but i know you want the empire to thrive and he said, well, you can hide it from everybody except for Lord Vader, who's now hmm. 
on the M on the Death Star mission. He's going to be overseeing the Death Star creation. So <laughs> you're not going to be able to hide the fact that you look down on a lot of Imperials, particularly, oh, who was it? Um, Tarkin. <laughs> he, he had a particular bone to pick with Tarkin. What bone was that? <laughs> Just that Tarkin was um, uh, kind of the rich get richer kind of thing. He didn't mm. think that Tarkin really earned his position and was just uh, just playing favorites for the for the emperor with the emperor. <laughs> it's like Tarkin, you're such a nepo baby. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. That's great. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, Director Krennic is, is is a visionary, and he's trying to bring bring about this the the true empire, the true strength of the empire comes from Director Krennic's vision. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting because it didn't. And let Thrawn doesn't like the Death Star in this, right? Like in this, canon? no, yeah. I don't I don't know what he, how he feels about it in this this one. He okay. didn't like the consolidation of imperial power. Gotcha. Um, under the emperor because he was like, well, you're all just puppets in the end. Like mm -hmm. I want a functioning military, not just have it done. Uh, so then one is Krennic's yeah. vision beyond the empire. Cause when I think of Krennic, I think death star. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like that's yeah. his baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. So actually the, the two competing ideas were um, in the new canons, Thrawn has his tie defender program, mm -hmm. which are shield and hyperspace capable tie TIE fighters smart <laughs> and he's wanting more yeah. decentralized high power fighters rather than mm -hmm. a centralized planet destroying super weapon mm -hmm. and they're vying for funds in that last book and Thrawn has Thrawn wages the funds of his defender program against uh the some finding out what's wrong with the supply lines in the uh Death Star I think very shortly after that is when he goes back to Lothal and gets hyperspaced away by the narwhals. Oh, man. The oh, Poggles? Yeah. The Dregdles? Purgle. Purgles. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should have just let him go, keep going until he says like everything. I, I know, right? I kind of regret correcting him now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be naming all fantasy creatures until we get to that. <laughs> yeah. The kobolds, the chocobos, <laughs> <laughs> the chupacabras, <laughs> the Fresno skidwalkers, <laughs> nightcrawlers. That's what it was. Fresno nightcrawlers. Fresno nightcrawlers. Yeah. My bad. God, those things are crazy. Uh, yeah. So that line, I greet you, but I do not welcome you. You bring a discord and a poison among us. Uh, we do not need more discord on Honogar. Mm, mm -hmm. Oh, man. They're just peeling back the onion layers here to see, like, oh, man, this thing's rotten on the inside. That was really cool. Yeah. Chewbacca, he broke something in the ship. So all his, um, yeah. he spent his four days admiring in the ship or like at least looking around it and then knew exactly what to do mm -hmm. to pull off whatever obfuscation they needed to do with um whatever Kabarak had told them good old chewy mm -hmm. good old chewy i hope he uh <laughs> just the amount of hair that humans drop i imagine mm -hmm. that he would have just, he's got to be there with a hand vac, just like wiping down all like the sticky. I don't know what you call the sticky rollies. Like it's a oh, bit of tape lint roller yeah. on a wheel. Lint yeah. Lint rollers. roller. He's just going yeah. across all the surfaces <laughs> after his, like, that's why it took him so long. He knew exactly how to break that thing. But, but then it was just going over all the surfaces with a sticker. <laughs> yeah. I hope they took some time to do that, but I mean, they were also pretty rushed to hide. Yeah. They were there for four days too. Like mm -hmm. just the amount of DNA evidence that you leave in a space by being there for ten minutes. Yeah. I was convinced that Thrawn was gonna walk into the room and see Wookie hair or, or smell Leo's perfume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or something stupid like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I can I can imagine like at least Rook would like smell chewy, you know? Mmm. Um, I don't know why, uh, since we've been spending more time with the Naguri, I've, I've been having a really hard time picturing what they look like. And 
the way they written and their their the way they're described, I keep thinking cat because they're like he purred, he hissed. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I I did I did look it up, and uh, from the rebels' interpre- interpretation of what they look like, I've come to the conclusion they just look like the but ugly Martians. What? The what? The what? I have shared links. Please take a look. The first one is the <laughs> Rebels Noguri, yeah. and the second one is the but ugly Martians. Oh, uh-huh. uh, my God. And I believe they're uh, okay. the same species, <laughs> or at least from the same planet. <laughs> <laughs> it's all connected. Um, I always pictured it as being kind of like reptilian in a way, with like short needle teeth or something, but. Oh really? Yeah, I guess they're a little bit. I guess they're a little bit different. Yeah. In the in the legends article, I'm not going to read anything because we know what we get for reading. But the pictures here. <laughs> yeah, don't read. <laughs> <laughs> the pictures make them look like um, almost like predators. Do the do the predators mm-hmm. have a name? Like the aliens are xenomorphs, right? Do the predators have yeah. a name? Oh, Ooh, do oh, they? Well, those kind oh, of that's a good question. All right, let me look it up now. <laughs> uh, I want to say they do, and I do not. Right, because they, uh, I think they I look like predators with just like mm, kind of more expected Rottweiler jaws. They mm. do. How do you pronounce this? Uh, <laughs> Yautja, I think. Yautja. The Yautja. Wait, what? They were officially licensed to appear in the seventh season of Rick and Morty? What? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, they look totally different in the in the two the canon legends like once they animated them that look they look completely different because like all these ones come from let's see this one comes i mean from... keep the rebels art style in mind <laughs> yeah uh the new essential guide to alien species is the main picture on the on the first webs on the legends page and then we've got some from some comic books uh republic and crimson empire three oh, wow they're blue in jedi academy huh yeah, uh, the, I am seeing the Yasha, also known as the Hish. Interesting. I, I like the name Hish. That's pretty cool for them. That is pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. Now it just sounds way more made up. <laughs> <laughs> Although they've got like those, um, what would you call those? Articulated jaws? Mm-hmm. So Mandibles? Maybe they maybe? can, yeah, yeah, almost. Yeah. But like, maybe they can pronounce stuff differently that we can't. Mm-hmm. It's super off topic. I thought Prey was super good. Prey is awesome. Prey looked good. Predators is also very good. Speaking of Predator, we have to acknowledge the late Carl Weathers. Right. Wait, do we? Who's Carl Weathers? Oh, right. (laughs) Do we? (laughs) 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 Well, when this 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 comes out, this is going to be canceled. (laughs) This is going to be several months after his death. Yeah. Yeah, no, RIP Carl Weathers. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. He gave us the best Grogu content <laughs> <laughs> in the episodes he directed. <laughs> oh, he was a director in those. Yeah, he directed a few Mandalorian episodes. Oh, cool. Yeah, he directed um the one uh that uh Keller and Beck is in. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah, that was a good episode. Yeah, and the one where um they raided that Imperial base on. Uh, Navarro. Oh, Navarro, uh huh. Was that with the pirates? The one where Grogu's in school. <laughs> yeah, he uh-huh. directed that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty common for actors to start directing, especially in TV shows. Mm. Mm. <laughs> that, that, that photo of Arnold Schwarzenegger and hey, <laughs> Carl Weathers' arms just grabbed onto each other. Classic. Classic. <laughs> it will be permanently burned in my mind forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Legendary. <laughs> Dewey. <laughs> I, I, I I'm not making fun of you, and I get it. Like it is going to go away later. Just <laughs> hearing, <laughs> hearing Scott be like, "Oh, we have to <laughs> pay respects." And <laughs> <you're> like, <"Do> we? <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Stuart. It's Apollo Creed, man. Come on. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry. I'm just really bad with names. <laughs> it's all good. It's all yeah. good. <laughs> He's combat Carl in Toy Story. 
Ya <laughs> sih. Oh shit. Uh, I should have been his name like for his whole life. Combat Carl. 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 Combat Carl. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, he was a football player before being an actor. Oh, was he? Yeah. I could say that. Yeah. He's kind of got like the broadness for it. He does, yeah. I was shocked to find out he was 74 when he passed away because he looked like he was in his 60s. Mm-hmm. Early yeah. 60s. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he started his college career in 1966. And sh- shortly after the Civil Rights Act got passed. Oh, damn, what a cool guy. R.I.P. Carl Weathers. Thanks for everything. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. I loved him. Happy Gilmore. Oh, wait. I was wrong. Civil Rights Act was 1968. That uh, just makes him even more badass. Yeah. <laughs> so I dropped, um, we get a sentence from Nogri here in their language and says, uh, Ilir ush mir lak savole mir le kara siv maleri ush vire vedarush. <laughs> and <laughs> knowing that they have a bakehouse, I can't help but see these all as different strains of weed. <laughs> <laughs> I would try some Vaderish. <laughs> Maybe that's why I wrote can't smell chewy because it's just so so overpowered <laughs> with so the, over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the last of the greenery on their planet. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've never seen so much green in my whole life or whatever she said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, last, last chapter, we got um, some comment about doing practical linguistics or applied linguistics. Uh, and that we have two names in this sentence as the Malari Ush and Veda Ush. Makes mm-hmm. me think that Ush is a kind of honorific, possibly. Mm-hmm. Which I don't like this commenting about social primitiveness. I think there needs to be some other name for that. Like they're very honor bound society. So I'm guessing that that honorifics in an, in an honorable society is quite important. So for for some reason we've got some the name Maleri and Veda, mm-hmm. and then we also have this other one which is I- Ilar Ilarush. Have mm. we had mention of a character Ilar before or? I don't recall. What's the context of this sentence? Could it just be like a generic title? Mm, possibly. Um, so we're... It wasn't one of the, the, the dynasts that were mentioned in the previous chapter, was it? Mm, not that I recall. But the, the context is that uh, Leia gets shepherded into Stand Before the No Green. And... Uh, Kabrak is introducing like this is the person well you know from the context I'm guessing is like yeah this is the person that I was talking about this is the daughter of Lord Vader and I'm wondering like if he's trying to speak to somebody there named Ilar like maybe the the the, the Matrix name is Ilar yeah maybe it is I mean it's not much to go on here but no it's it's not <laughs> but it's fun Let's see. And then we have Sforle and Mirle. Oh, okay. So that makes me wonder what Lay is as well. Hmm. Hmm. Lak Mirka Savole. Mirle. Kara Siv. Malariush. Yeah. You think possibly there are other um, suffixes for. Maybe. Or maybe. Like a masculine and feminine thing or. Possibly. Or, or different, different rankings, maybe? I, I mean, we don't have much to go on, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe it's um, like I don't know, prepositions or something else. Mm, no, like maybe um, maybe Ush could be like uh, to like to Malari or to Vader or to Ilir, like saying mm. what you're um, uh, giving like an idea or a gesture to. Mm, mm-hmm. Not just like a Mister or Mrs or some sort of title. Yeah, it could be. Again, nothing to go on, but it's fun to speculate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if we're going to get much more uh, no-agree language in this. I would love to, because I actually really like it. 
Mm -hmm. By the end of this book, we're going to be fluent. (laughs) (laughs) Fingers crossed. (laughs) I got to finish Klingon first. Okay. That makes me wonder, is this kind of like Timothy Zahn's version of the Klingon? (laughs) The Nogri? Maybe. Hmm. Is there an inspiration there? Uh, they are mentioned only, mentioned only, first appearance in Ed of the Empire. Um, Timothy Zahn originally intended for the Nogri to be called the Sith, thus making mm. Darth Vader Dark Lord of the Sith. Oh, neat. This idea came into conflict with Lucasfilm and was thus forced to change. Another species was ultimately given the Sith name. In addition, Zahn initially planned to reveal in... Uh, yeah, I can read this. Uh, the novel Air to the Empire that Darth Vader's mask had been designed as a stylized impression of a Nogri face to enhance the Dark Lord's ability to command the Nogri Death Commandos. Ooh. But was again overruled. <laughs> oh, man. Because hmm. he was prevented from explicitly making a such a suggestion. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. While the author was prevented from explicitly making such a suggestion he believed that he would be permitted to do so in one of the subsequent books so he designed the alien's appearance with the mask in mind huh that makes a lot of sense based on what we saw in the legends article yeah Mm. yeah they do look a lot more like his face that's cool yeah the other idea is that throughout their lifestyle no good children starting life with a pale gray color that darkened as they age becoming black at the same time they reach adulthood hmm. zan ultimately decided to reject this concept as to avoid any negative racial connotations uh, mm-hmm. probably a good call yeah yeah <laughs> i mean we do see a little bit of it in here that um i think i mentioned that uh Kabarak was quite pale as compared mm-hmm. to, to the elders um being a much darker gray I think Pelion made that uh, made that ob- observation. Mm. All right, so back to Rebels, Rook. How old? Based on that, I would say Rook is maybe middle aged in this Rebels depiction. Yeah, you sure? he seems know, quite maybe, pale. I mean, when he's in the light, it makes him look more pale. Hmm. By the same logic, you'd say the shadow makes him look darker. But I'm kind of like trying to think in between those two shades. Right. Yeah. We need a good color grader to come through. Too, yeah. <laughs> Bring the contrast all the way down. Let me do that right now. <laughs> contrast all the way down. Whoa. <laughs> How does it go? Getting a bit of a better idea. All right. This is a very quick adjustment, and I went on the brighter side, but it does bring things a bit more on the same page. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I, we, we don't have a lot to go off. No, either. we really don't. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah. Like whether this idea is still present in canon or not as well might be different yeah. too. Well, I mean, even then, like if it's inspired by the same character, then we could um, assume that there might be some overlapping possibilities. Mm, but, no. but again, we're purely speculating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but honestly, I could see Rook being young. That's the one I lean towards based on that question that you presented earlier, Stuart. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, here's another photo. Yeah, so, like, in the Jedi Academy game, they kind of make him look almost, like, reptilian. Yeah. And then whereas, like, the Rebels depiction of Rook has, like, a single ridge with, like, you know, dots, like, going up his forehead and like over his head Mm. in some of the other artwork i've seen they have like two ridges going like you know on either side of their head up yeah the vader brow yeah Uh uh-huh there could be like different variations like different subspecies or something too that kind of like small nose at the top with a very distinct kind of like triangle yeah there the teeth coming up that yeah it really does look very Vader's mask. Yeah, While we're in pure speculation true. mode, here's Klingons for comparison. <laughs> 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 they do have some of those, those same like bumps going up the middle of the forehead right. that um, mm. Rook does in mm-hmm. Rebels. Hmm. Yeah. Did any of you ever get into uh, Star Trek? 
mildly. I wanted to, but I don't know. It just it was so slow. (laughs) (laughs) To me, Star Trek and Star Wars is kind of like coffee versus tea. Uh Star Wars is coffee and Star Trek is tea. (laughs) Yeah. One's Mm -hmm. like (laughs) more refined, not as exciting, but yeah. (laughs) But they ultimately push the the same buttons in some ways. (laughs) Yeah. Picard Picard does love his Earl Grey. (laughs) (laughs) I saw like a like a Venn diagram. It wasn't a Venn diagram. It was like a political alignment chart for for um, sci-fi and fantasy. And one axis was gives you very strong fantasy vibes, and the other axis is is actually science. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and science and, and yeah. Star Wars was very. Uh, which one? Was, it was uh, <laughs> doesn't do the science, but it feels aesthetically very science. Whereas <laughs> Star Trek is does the science and is aesthetically science. I think the other side was like Harry Potter and uh, maybe Discworld. I think like by Terry Pratchett was Ah. very aesthetically uh fantasy but the everything under the hood is science (laughs) and personally for me my default when i think of science fiction is more fantastical Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right because that's just what most of it is the space fantasy the space opera kind of genre. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly um it's i see it as a very philosophical genre if if anything like i feel like the Mm. hard sci-fi thing is a more recent um thing within the past few decades no i haven't read so much of of like classic sci-fi um but i would tend to agree with you things like um the invisible man or john carter of mars yeah, John Carter of Mars mm-hmm. or um, like yeah. Planet of the Apes or something like that. It's just like, well, what if we had this idea and what's yeah. a setting that we could make this plausibly happen in? And Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, yeah. Yeah. Even like calling um, Frankenstein a science fiction novel mm. is like, yeah. well, what if we can just create life? That was That is science fiction. And mm-hmm. what are the ethical or moral implications of of that having happening (laughs) and you've got the story of frankenstein yeah yeah there's this one science fiction movie from 1956 that i watched recently and loved called forbidden planet oh yeah and yeah it pioneered um like a lot of different aspects of it like it was the first to have a ship that could go like faster than light within it Uh uh-huh i'm trying i know about it i'm trying to remember if i've actually seen it yeah super fun it has (laughs) It has um, Leslie Nielsen in it. That's right. It does, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Huh. He's playing a normal human. <laughs> it feels very weird. <laughs> Leslie Nielsen. Yeah. Oh, uh huh. Yeah. The effects hold up the shockingly well. Driven. I honestly believed it was an '80s movie based on how it looked. Hmm. I mean, it looks very much like Logan's Run. Where did you find that? Uh, it's. Yeah, it's on Tubi right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, free with ads. Yeah. And I mean, even if you do consider, like, Logan's Run as well was uh, old sci-fi uh, yeah. as well. But, like, <laughs> there was no, nothing particularly hard science about that at all. <laughs> Logan's Run is a weird sci-fi for me because I feel like it's a bit more conservative than the genre usually is. What do you mean by that? Because the fear is, I mean, it's essentially we're afraid of the youths and their sex, drugs, and rock and roll. (laughs) (laughs) Like, that's the movie's themes uh, distilled to a core. Like, the young are portrayed as very, like, hedonistic. um, Mm. And, I mean, now once you get to 30, you die, and that's it. And then, um, I mean, the whole rousing... (laughs) (laughs) The rousing speech in the movie isn't necessarily about, like... um, some like freedom to choose or anything it's just like i want to grow old which like is a freedom of choice but it's not um it feels much more traditional than i would expect sci-fi to be Hmm. which makes it an interesting one for me Hmm. see i thought it was an environmental disaster movie that was ended up being some political conspiracy how neat because they weren't allowed to leave the dome and because it was supposed to be like fallout radiation from from the war 
and the only way that we can maintain our our um, resources is by capping life at 30 and it was about the altruism of like well you get to enjoy this life but it only lasts so long and you have to give that up for the next generation so our hero is a climate denier then (laughs) so it is a conservative (laughs) sci-fi movie (laughs) he's the one that goes out and does his own research and comes back and says guys it's fine out there (laughs) yeah (laughs) That's not where I was expecting this to go. (laughs) (laughs) We were talking about old movies and Star Trek and I, my brain just got lost and I was trying to think of a movie series with Jeffrey Combs in it. It was the, it was the reanimator (laughs) series. (laughs) Yeah. The (laughs) reanimator. I've not heard of that one. It's, I, I don't know if it's your kind of movie, Stuart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Highly recommended, though. Some great A schlock. Mm. Yeah. Uh, did anybody think that Leia was leaning a little bit too hard on uh, my daddy was Lord Vader, and you're going to respect me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I feel like I'm... that Loki comes out in Leia a lot, though. <laughs> <laughs> like her her like and she gets a, a little entitled sometimes <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's a fair guess based on what she's witnessing in the culture <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i would probably try to lean into the power aspect too but um she <laughs> definitely did not get the memo that kabarak might be the only one thinking this <laughs> yeah or yeah, yeah. pushing for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, because that's when they get that line about, like, I don't welcome you here. <laughs> yeah, Le- Leia, just learn to keep your mouth shut, honestly. Right. That probably would have yeah. been the better thing to do in this situation. <laughs> yeah, I guess they're just feeling pressed for time, though, because they know the Imperials there, and they yeah. know that it, they've been noticed. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they really got to deal with it. Yeah. I mean, we're almost lucky that Chewie came back when he did, because otherwise they wouldn't have been forced to make that decision of like okay well we are going to trust you for now let's let's mm-hmm. let's give this a go go to the bake house yeah <laughs> everybody get under those heat lamps yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh poor chewy in the bake house oh no <laughs> his fur is gonna keep that scent for days yeah. days. Oh how's his temperature regulation going to be I'm gonna start turning green Oh my god. Is he gonna pass out? <laughs> no, he'll be fine. Like like with me, I got a big beard and people are like, Isn't your face hot in the summer? I'm like, no, it's like the most climate controlled part of my body. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> yeah, it keeps the heat out, it keeps the warm in, it just it's stays the same pretty much. Oh my god. <laughs> oh neat. Maybe I want fur then. <laughs> And so I guess in this, the fact that Thrawn wasn't thinking to look for Leia or that that deception would happen so close to home is the one time that his all <laughs> omnipotence is, is slacking. Yeah. Any thoughts on him making that assumption? As I'm not perfect, can you repeat the assumption? <laughs> oh, he... <laughs> Just that he was like, no, no, he wouldn't be stupid enough to bring something here with him. You know, the the real thing is like, where has he been for a month? Not the, he's brought some spies uh, back with him. Like, should I, should I put a tail on the on the city? Mm, yes, we'll do that. But it, it can take time. We've got to go look for, look for layers. He wouldn't be smart enough to bring the evidence back home with him. Right. True, yeah. Um... At the same time, though, I feel like Thrawn, yes, he appears om- omnipotent, but most of what he said in the past, I feel like there is, has at least been some sort of basis for it. Mm. Like, I mean, the thing with who was on which ship is crazy. Like, uh, if we remember yeah. that, where he's like, oh, based on the amount of time they took, then, like, <laughs> you know, like Chewie would be on this or whatever. Mm-hmm. But he has no, no, I'm 100% off. behind that one. Yeah. I'm 100% behind that one. <laughs> uh, but, like, he has something to go off of. Um, with this, I mean, this dude's just been missing for a bit. And so, what is there for him to assume? I mean, he can make assumptions, but mm. he doesn't have as many pieces to go off of. So maybe yeah. he considers it a possibility, but 
right now his mind is just like something's up here and that's it mm. yeah okay yeah i think he's probably taking it one step at a time yeah that's probably for the best you gotta get on that hunt for leia yep and then do you think this is the last we're gonna see of cabrak he's being reassigned to some out of village oh some other base as well i wonder if he'll join the team join the rebels <laughs> I mean, at the moment, like, his Leia's only in in this place, and the only person that kind of trusts Leia and what she says that she is, or mm-hmm. willing to hear her out. Yeah. I feel like if Leia's going to get out of this, then she's going to make sure he comes with her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And then they mentioned something about, like, a decon droids. Um, again, don't look up your MacGuffins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, decon droids are the decontamination droids. Mm-hmm. They're there to help the Nogri uh, clean their environmental disaster. Just because they're going to put a a probe into into a decon droid, and we want to read and find out what happens. Oh my god, my <laughs> yeah, my mind completely read that as something like a reconnaissance droid, like a recon droid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I was, like, so I, I, was I was thinking, oh, like they just Defcon. have. I was like, they just naturally have probe droids all around the Nogri and they're cool with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that makes a lot more sense about him <laughs> mentioning a curious Nogri. <laughs> yeah. So the Nogri have a pretty good deal with the Empire then. Huh. Yeah, it seems mm-hmm. like it. The New Republic probably won't give these same kind of resources. Mm, it seems like it. Yeah. Is it a good deal if you get sent <laughs> wave after wave to die? <laughs> <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> I mean, it's that or lose your entire ecosystem. That's yeah, yeah. I just had a mental image of Thrawn as Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I would much rather have Thrawn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. technology to save your climate, but I own you, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? I'm still picturing him as that again. <laughs> Elon Musk is Zap Brannigan? No, no, Thrawn. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I mean that works. That does work. Elon is that does work. Anything else out of this chapter? Yeah, I'm really liking the plot line here on mm, yeah. this planet. Um, this is honestly not where I expected the Nogri uh, thing with Leia to go. Mm-hmm. Because uh, they're not often this close to Thrawn. I mean, I guess in the last book, Thrawn was just like always off doing his own thing while our mm-hmm. heroes were doing theirs. And then occasionally the paths crossed. <laughs> yeah. But this is like a genuinely like unexpected instance. Mm. For me, at least. Yeah. yeah. I like where it's gone, which yeah, means we're not to. gonna see more of this for like five chapters. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, really so. <laughs> I'm just making a joke about Zon. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go to Smugglers next. <laughs> I mean, he hasn't done that to us. He's left the Smugglers like on hold for so long. Yeah, I have been wondering about them. <laughs> this has been The Lost Holocron. You can find transcripts, links to discussions, and more at our website, lostholocron.com. While you're there, you can learn how you can support the creation of future episodes. Read on, and we'll be waiting for you in the next transmission. We would be honored if you would join us.